can be making your way up. <laughs> so there's so much that I still want to continue to be able to say about Brother Jason. And um, there are those in our lives that, that God puts in our lives, and we're just so thankful. And um, Brother Jason is certainly one of those guys for me. What's that? Just no, no, yeah, I'm not, I'm not done. Because now I want to compliment my people. Okay. Okay, all right. So, and, um, you know, I, I, I think about how the Lord does temper and bring us together. And whenever we have a meeting like that, and I am able to stand before our congregation here and be able to introduce speakers, and then to know when the speakers leave, how comfortable they feel and the liberty that they have to preach here that brings me to tears and it, and it really does um, because this group has a genuine love for the Lord a genuine love for the Lord's people a genuine love for myself and my family you guys pray that and show that all the time and I believe a genuine love for you as well brother Jason and so with that would you come and please preach to us the message now? Okay. okay. I got right. a Yep. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> it has been a blessing to be here and to get to visit with you again. We appreciate the invitation, the kindness of the assembly. We love y'all and we know you love us and uh, appreciates the the Myers putting up with us and, you know, and Max, the dog. So uh, it's, it's just been a good weekend. And I want to end it on a note about the importance of God's word. Amen. Luke chapter 16, if you would. Luke chapter 16. We're just going to read the end of the account, verses 29 through 31. However, we will refer back to the entirety of the, the story that Jesus is telling here. Starting at verse 29, Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving Father, Lord, again, we just thank you for the love that you've shown for us, for the privilege of being able to assemble together. Yes. We ask, Lord, that you'd please be with brother and sister Pack. Yes. You'd, you'd uplift them, give them strength. And ask, Lord, that you'd please be with us in this meeting, that you'd bless the reading of your word. Lord, I ask that you would please send your spirit to move amongst us, to cause us to understand not only the sufficiency of Scripture, but also point us to the Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom all scripture speaks. Yes. I ask the Lord that you please forgive me of my failures. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 So to put this in context of the chapter. Verses 1 through 13. Jesus is telling the story of the unjust steward. In order to lead to a specific conclusion. In verse 13. He says you cannot serve God and riches. And so immediately, verse 14 describes the Pharisees who were greedy derided Jesus for that teaching. They scoffed, they, they ridiculed, they jeered at the Savior for daring to say that God's blessings do not always come in the form of earthly treasure. And folks, that's a lesson that's desperately needed today. Amen. And Jesus' answer in the following verses leads up to this account of the rich man and Lazarus. And it's important to understand the context because in reality, in Luke 16, there are two thoughts that serve as the foundation for what is really a very well-known story. The first thought 
is the one that seems the most clear to us, that God abhors when we focus on earthly things like riches. So Jesus says in verse 15, the end of verse 15, God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. All the worldly riches you can gain will do nothing to bring you righteousness in the eyes of God. Amen. The second thought that flows through this story is the permanent and sufficient nature of God's word. You can see Jesus already has that in his mind in verse 17. He says it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one tittle of the law to fail. In other words, the sun could lose its sight, the, the stars fall from heaven, the earth beneath your feet could crumble away. All of that is more likely to happen than God's word failing. Mm -hmm. So with both of those trains of thought in his mind, Jesus tells us a story that really bears on both of those truths, the vanity of riches and the sufficiency of scripture. Yeah. And he starts to weave his argument to this beautiful tapestry of truth. And, and I just have to say, when I say truth, let's be clear that when Jesus speaks a parable, the scriptures tell us that Jesus speaks a parable. That's right. When Jesus says in verse 20, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. You know, he, he's using a proper name there. It's not telling us that this is a parable, that this is a made up story as an example. Right? This is a true story to the Amen. point where Jesus is even using the proper names of one of the characters of the story. You know, we preachers sometimes struggle to illustrate our points, but Jesus is the sovereign God of the universe, come in flesh. He has no trouble rousing up the perfect illustration from the banks of history. Now, for our purposes, we're only going to concentrate on one of those two strings of thought. If the Spirit allows, we're going to examine Christ's declaration about the sufficient nature of Scripture. Amen. And we're going to do it in three points. First, I want you to see the sinner that's being described here. Verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. You see here Jesus, early in the account, focusing on that first line of thinking. There is a rich man. Society thinks that he's righteous because God has blessed him with these riches. And then there's Lazarus, who's the beggar, left at the gate of the rich man's house eating the scraps that are thrown out. Not enough physical strength to fend off the dogs that come to lick his oozing sores. Man, he is just... I, I, yeah. I picture him just waiting outside of Joel Osteen's big house, waiting for the rich guy to come out and tell him how he can be living his best life now. <laughs> when death inevitably comes for them both, there is a great reversal of roles. We find the rich man was spiritually poor and the poor man was spiritually rich. The rich man loses the comforts of this life and is in torment. But poor Lazarus leaves behind the pain of this life and he's carried by the angels into paradise. Now we'll soon see that the rich man did not go to hell because he was rich. Neither did Lazarus go to heaven because he was poor. That's right. They both went to their eternal destination as a result of their faith or lack of faith in the promises of God. But look at that reversal of roles that takes place when they die. To me, nothing shows it more graphically than verse 24, where the rich man cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. 
and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. The rich man who never would have lowered himself to the level of Lazarus, who would have despised the very thought of being touched by that dirty beggar covered with sores and dog slobber, now begs for Lazarus to dip his finger in water and put his finger in my mouth because I am tormented in this flame. Mm -hmm. Now people on earth, Do not see this contrast. In fact, verse 22 tells us that the rich man died and there's a big funeral going on. Meanwhile, Lazarus died and the only ones who seemed to notice were the angels. I wonder how many rich men stepped over Lazarus' body on the way to worry about getting to the rich man's funeral. Had this happened today, this rich man would have been greatly mourned. The funeral homes would have been filled with garlands and flowers, a a standing room only crowd looking over the body and saying such ridiculous things like, oh, they did such a good job. I'm sorry for your loss. He was such a nice person. The heartbreaking truth is that funeral after funeral, we finally remember the life of some lost sinner while at that very moment they are in hell. We're happily telling stories about them while they're begging and screaming in torment. Mm. You know, the miracle of God before Moses where he, where he burned a bush and the bush was not consumed, that is not the only time that God does such a thing. The flaming torment of hell is the same miracle in which lost sinners spend eternity wishing that they could die. That's right. Amen. In the New Testament, there are two words that are interpreted as as hell. One word, the one used here is Hades, which is a way to describe the afterlife. But many times Jesus also uses the word Gehenna. And originally, what that word's referring to is what's called the Valley of Hinnom that was south of Jerusalem. Idolatrous Jews back in the Old Testament used it as a place for human sacrifice. It was therefore hated. It was a place that was considered unclean. I mean, you wouldn't want to build your house in a place that had been used for human sacrifice, and neither would I. And so none of the Jews did either. And that place in that valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem, became the place where trash and dead animals and unclean bodies were were thrown there, and they were burned. And anybody who was familiar with it would visualize that place and say, I know that place. That is the place where the fire never stops burning and the worms never stop eating. Mm. Several times Jesus used that real place as a description of the eternal torment of the wicked. Mm. And so this rich man, he has nothing. He had his money, but it was not sufficient to save him. His heritage as a descendant of Abraham was not sufficient to save him. He had a loving family, and that's not sufficient to save him. And now he finds himself thrown on God's burning trash heap of eternity, and he's offered a conversation with the patriarch of his heritage. And yet for all the things that have changed, there are some things with him that have not changed at all. Because we see lots of remembering and lots of regret, lots of concern for his family, But we also see there is no repentance, neither is there a change of mind about the only thing that was sufficient to save him. There is, in truth, in this rich man, still an appeal to the things that are not sufficient. He appeals to Abraham by calling him Father Abraham. And he's right, as a Jew, a descendant of Abraham. And Abraham even recognizes that in verse 25, he calls this rich man, my son. That was the basis for righteousness in Jews' minds. And now from the depths of hell, he thinks that perhaps that heritage is going to earn him a little bit of relief. But even that is rejected. Folks, I wonder how many well-rounded citizens, how many people raised in Christian homes and sitting in church pews, but without a relationship with Jesus. 
think that that's going to earn them a place in heaven. It is not. That's right. Folks, without Jesus Christ, your Christian heritage will not so much as earn you a drop of water to relieve the torment of hell. That's right. And verse 25 and 26, there's no hope of relief for his torment. And so he rightly and understandably starts to focus on his family instead while there's still hope. And that's when he makes an alternative suggestion. Verse 27, then he said, I pray thee, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, I've got five brothers that he might testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now, before completely discrediting this rich man, let me say first, he recognizes there is power in personal testimony. It doesn't seem like that outrageous of an idea at first. I mean, he knows that he can't leave hell. He knows that Lazarus cannot come and help him in his torment. But there's still hope for his brothers, and so he recognizes, look, the personal testimony that could be found through Lazarus could help his brothers. He doesn't ask for a theologian. He doesn't ask for a Bible scholar to go back. Just let that beggar Lazarus go back. They'll believe the testimony of Lazarus, he says. But that can't happen. And let that be a lesson to you in this life. You need to share your personal testimony with the world while you're in it. Mm. Amen. If you have a family that you want to hear the gospel, you need to be the one telling them the gospel. And don't worry about, well, I don't have wise words. I, I don't have eloquent speech. Listen, you can be a witness of Jesus by describing your own experience. That's what a witness is, after all. Amen. You don't have to answer, and you don't have to have the answers to every possible question. Just tell them what you know. You know, back in chapter 9, Jesus healed a blind man and, and in John 9, and he was called on to answer more questions than he could answer. Right? All of a sudden, this man, who everybody knew was blind, could see. And so the Pharisees are coming at him, and they're asking him all these questions that he didn't know the answers to. And so he finally summed it up like this. He's like, I know one thing, one thing I know. Whereas I was blind. Now I see. Yeah. Right? It is a powerful thing to just tell people what the Lord's done for you. But the reality is this rich man is not interested in the personal testimony of Lazarus. He had not heard that while he was alive. And he didn't care about it that much in his afterlife either. This rich man was most interested in Lazarus' ability to show his brothers a miraculous sign. They'll believe if there is some sort of miraculous confirmation of God's message. And so Abraham says to him in verse 29, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now there's two ways to consider what Abraham means by Moses and the prophets. And really there's only a subtle difference between them. The first way is it could mean they have the word of God and the men of God, right? They, that, the primary focus of the, the Hebrews was the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. And all the prophets expounded and extended the truths contained there. So Abraham could be saying they have the word of God and the men of God. And in context, that would make sense. He says, let them hear them, plural. The other possibility is that Abraham is just referring to the entirety of the Old Testament. That term Moses and the prophets is a way uh, of encompassing all of the written word of God. In fact, when Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus with some disciples, it says that he, it, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures and things concerning himself. So really there's only a slight difference between those two possibilities. The reality is the rich man would have rejected either one of them anyway. What follows here is the most extraordinary argument about the sufficiency of Scripture found in the Bible or in all of history. 
Because the two parties that are arguing with each other are unique in that one, the rich man had the scripture and would not believe them. The other, Abraham, believed without ever having any of the scripture. Mm. Let me just digress for a moment and try to make a point about the nature of God's word. That's going to tell us that God's word is in the message, not in the medium. And by that I mean for all the proper importance that we place on the scripture, and rightly so. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. We are not saved by faith in the written word. We are saved by faith in the Savior of the written word. Amen. We emphasize the written word because that's what we know of God's message today. But Abraham believed God's message through the audible voice of God. Moses believed God's message through a burning bush. Jonah came to believe God's message as he was being turned into fish vomit. You have the message of God's written word. And so what you have in your hands is no less miraculous than what Abraham experienced, what Moses experienced, what Jonah experienced. Amen. And you are equally responsible for believing it. Think about it for a moment. The Bible is a collection of dozens of writers in three different languages on two different continents over the course of about 2,000 years. And all of it focuses on the same theme of Jesus Christ, the Savior. That book you hold in your hands, it is a miracle itself. Yeah. Yes. And it should be believed. You shouldn't have to have other miracles to believe. Amen. For all that's changed about the rich man's condition, there's something that has not changed. He refuses. He rejects the word of God as being sufficient to save sinners. It was not good enough for him. It will not be good enough for his brothers. Abraham rejected his request to send Lazarus back and, and, and instead insisted his brothers have everything they need with Moses and the prophets. And the rich man's reply to that was, no, absolutely not. Verse 30, nay, Father Abraham, you're wrong. If one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Moses and the prophets is not enough to convict them of their sin and bring them to faith. But if somebody goes back from the dead, they'll repent. Mm. I can't tell you how often I hear people say, well, you're not just serious about just preaching the word, right? Just preaching the Bible. People won't understand. That won't be enough. You've got to, you know, assess their felt needs. You have to appeal to their mindset. You have to come up with some sort of program that, or, or, or method that charms their hearts. And let me tell you, if you don't hear people say it, you at least see it in practice a lot. That's right. Amen. You can almost hear this rich man saying, you know what, I'm down here because you can't come up with a better method of evangelism than that. So let me help you out. I know something that will convict and convince my brothers, but it's going to take a big show. It can't just be the word of God. It has to be something more appealing than that. Folks, <laughs> hear me here. Yes. The notion that you will accentuate the gospel in some way that makes it appealing for the world to accept is absolute heresy. You see the very origin of that thinking right here. The idea of winning people to Christ with muppets and puppets and amazements and magic shows is a notion devised straight from the depths of hell. Amen. Instead, the word is absolutely sufficient. Amen. Let's see the sufficiency of the word. Verse 31, he said unto him, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Gimmicks will not save. Signs will not save. No message from the dead will save. But there is an absolute sufficiency in scripture yes. to save sinners. Yes. Even, 
even proclaiming to believe in the sufficiency of Scripture will not be enough to save because whatever the extreme of your religious viewpoint, religion will not save you. Jesus' harshest words were reserved for Bible scholars and religious leaders. The liberal group of his day were the Sadducees, and he told them in Matthew 22, 29, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And then he rebuked the most conservative and self-righteous among them for their proud hearts. He says in John 5, you don't have his word abiding in you. Search the scripture, for in them you think that you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, and yet you will not come to me that you might have life. The word of God is ultimately about Jesus. Amen. Ask yourself, what sends a person to hell? It is a refusal to trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ as revealed in Scripture. And if God's word cannot convince and crack a hard heart, neither will great miracles. Mm. Jesus' own resurrection is all the proof you need of that. Amen. Jesus rose from the dead. That's right. And no doubt some of these same Pharisees reacted to it, not in faith, but by bribing the Roman guards to lie about what happened. In a twist that's more than coincidence, Jesus would very soon after this raise a man from the dead. It should have reminded them about what Jesus said here. His name was Lazarus for crying out loud. And their reaction was not to come to faith in Jesus because they saw someone rise from the dead. But John 12.10 says the chief priest planned how they might murder Jesus and Lazarus. In other words, if he keeps us up, we're going to kill that guy, and we're going to have to make that guy dead again. At the crucifixion of Jesus, Matthew 27 records in verses 51 through 53, the earth did quake, the rocks rent, the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Many people rose from the grave, wandered into the city. People who knew they were dead saw them alive. And there was a great revival in Jerusalem. Yeah, I don't find that verse anywhere. Because a good show won't say the word of God is sufficient Amen. for the salvation of sinners. Let me just go a step further and assure you that you, right now, at this very moment, are getting what the rich man wanted his brothers to get. Because you are hearing the testimony of a man who was once dead. I was dead in trespasses and sins until the day that the Holy Spirit used the message of God's word about Jesus Christ to instill new life in me. And yet even my own testimony is, is one having passed from death to life in Jesus Christ. That is not sufficient to save you. You need to hear the message of God's word. The rich man, even in the torment of hell, he had concern for his family, and yet he rejects the very thing that was sufficient to help them. How many of us do the same thing? You realize that in your home, in your life, with, with your children, you have the most powerful tool God has ever given to save souls. Amen. You have what you need to have eternal life. You have what you need to avoid the torment of hell. You have what you need to be able to get to heaven. You have the very message of salvation written and placed into your hands as a message from God himself. Yes. And this book is the message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. He came to save sinners from hell. He came to redeem them from the power of sin. And by his death, burial, and resurrection, he's proven that he has the power to save even the lowliest Lazaruses among us. 
And how do we respond? Oh, many times we're like the rich man who just fares sumptuously and indifferently gives God himself the crumbs of our life. There is no question where that kind of indifference takes you. Think about it this way. Where is that rich man today? Because we give ourselves the convenience of thinking about his fate on that day that Jesus spoke about him. But an understanding of scripture will tell us that now, 2,000 years later, he is still in hell, still tormented in the flames, still suffering his shame and everlasting contempt. That's right. And everyone who is waiting for a good show before they believe is on the fast track to keeping him company. The saving message of the gospel is found in this book, and it tells us about Jesus. Amen. And it's so complicated, it tells us, believe in Jesus. Amen. Trust in Jesus. Amen. Have faith in Jesus. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And you might think, well, oh, I'm not good enough for that. I don't deserve that. You're right. And I would not try to talk you out of that position. You and I deserve nothing except to be thrown on God's eternal burning trash heap of hell. And yet, you believe in Jesus and he saves you from that anyway. Amen. Just believe in Jesus. It's interesting to me that we don't get Abraham's testimony in this account. But if Abraham himself was to give his personal testimony, scriptures would tell us that it would be as something as complicated as this. I believed, and it was accounted to me for righteousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The beauty of the sufficient nature of scripture is the simplicity of it. Yes. Here's Jesus. Trust Jesus. No, no signs. No gimmicks, no somebody coming back from the dead to persuade you. Just, here's Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Amen. And you will be saved. Amen.